Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about the views of Mark Twain. Twain's views became more radical as he grew older. In a letter to a friend and fellow writer, William Dean Howells, in 1887, he acknowledged that his views had changed and developed over his lifetime referring to one of his favorite works. When I finished Carlyle's French Revolution in 1871, I was a Girardin. Every time I've read it since, I've read it differently, being influenced and changed little by little by life and environment. And now I lay the book down once more and recognize that I am a Sanchalot, and not a pale, characterless Sanchalot, but a Marit. Politics Twain was a staunch supporter of technological progress and commerce. He was against welfare measures because he believed that society in the business age is governed by exact and constant laws that should not be interfered with for the accommodation of any individual or political or religious faction. He opined that there's no good government at all and none possible. In the opinion of Washington University professor Guy A. Cardwell, By present standards, Mark Twain was more conservative than liberal. He believed strongly in laissez-faire, thought personal politics rights secondary to property rights, admired self-made plutocrats, and advocated a leadership to be composed of men of wealth and brains. Among his attitudes now more readily recognized as liberal were a faith in progress through technology and a hostility towards monarchy, inherited aristocracy, the Roman Catholic Church, and in his later years, imperialism. Labor. Twain wrote glowingly about unions in the riverboating industry and life on the Mississippi, which was read in union halls decades later. He supported the labor movement, especially one of the most important unions, the Knights of Labor. In a speech to them, he said, who are the oppressors? The few, the king, the capitalist, and a handful of other overseers and superintendents, Who are the oppressed, the many, the nations of the earth, the valuable personages, the workers, they that make the bread that the soft-handed and idle eat? He further wrote, Why is it right that there's not a fairer division of the spoil all around? Because laws and constitutions have ordered otherwise. Then it follows that laws and constitutions should change around and say there shall be a more nearly equal division. Imperialism Before 1899, Twain was an ardent imperialist. In the late 1860s and early 1870s, he spoke out strongly in favor of American interests in the Hawaiian Islands. He said the war with Spain in 1898 was the worthiest war ever fought. In 1899, however, he reversed course. In the New York Herald, October 16, 1900, Twain describes his transformation and political awakening in the context of the Philippine-American War to anti-imperialism. I wanted the American eagle to go screaming into the Pacific. Why not spread its wings over the Philippines, I asked myself. I said to myself, here are a people who have suffered for three centuries. We can make them as free as ourselves. Give them a government and a country of their own. Put a miniature of the American Constitution afloat in the Pacific. Start a brand new republic to take its place among the free nations of the world. It seemed to me a great task to which we had addressed ourselves. But I have thought some more since then, and I've read carefully the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Spanish-American War, and I have seen that we do not intend to free, but to subjugate the people of the Philippines. We have gone there to conquer, not to redeem. 
It should, it seems to me, be our pleasure and duty to make those people free and let them deal with their own domestic questions in their own way. And so I am an anti-imperialist. I am opposed to having the eagle put its talons on any other land. During the Boxer Rebellion, Twain said that the Boxer is a patriot. He loves his country better than he does the countries of other people. I wish him success. From 1901, soon after his return from Europe, until his death in 1910, Twain was vice president of the American Anti-Imperialist League, which opposed the annexation of the Philippines by the United States and had tens of thousands of members. He wrote many political pamphlets for the organization. The incident in the Philippines, posthumously published in 1924, was in response to the Moro Crater Massacre, in which 600 Moros were killed. Many of his neglected and previously uncollected writings on anti-imperialism appeared for the first time in a book form in 1992. Twain was critical of imperialism in other countries as well. In Following the Equator, Twain expresses hatred and condemnation of imperialism of all stripes. He was highly critical of European imperialists such as Cecil Rhodes and King Leopold II of Belgium, both of whom attempted to establish colonies on the African continent during the scramble for Africa. King Leopold's soliloquy is a political satire about his private colony, the Congo Free State. Reports of outrageous exploitation and grotesque abuses led to widespread international outcry in the early 1900s, arguably the first large-scale human rights movement. In the soliloquy, the king argues that bringing Christianity to the colony outweighs a little starvation. The abuses against Congolese forced laborers continued until the movement forced the Belgian government to take control of the colony. During the Philippine-American War, Twain wrote a short pacifist story titled The War Prayer, which makes the point that humanism and Christianity's preaching of love are incompatible with the conduct of war. It was submitted to Harper's Bazaar for publication. But on March 22, 1905, the magazine rejected the story as not quite suited to a woman's magazine. Eight days later, Twain wrote to his friend, Daniel Carter Beard, to whom he had read the story, I don't think the prayer will be published in my time. None but the dead are permitted to tell the truth. Because he had an exclusive contract with Harper and Brothers, Twain could not publish the war prayer elsewhere. It remained unpublished until 1916. It was republished in the 1960s as campaigning material by anti-war activists. Twain acknowledged that he had originally sympathized with the more moderate Girondists of the French Revolution, and then shifted his sympathies to the more radical Sanchalots, indeed identifying himself as a Marat and writing that the reign of terror paled in comparison to the old terrors that preceded it. Twain supported the revolutionaries in Russia against the reformists, arguing that the Tsar must be got rid of by violent means because peaceful ones would not work. He summed up his views of revolutions in the following statement, I am said to be a revolutionist in my sympathies. By birth, by breeding, and by principle, I am always on the side of the revolutionists because there never was a revolution unless there were some oppressive and intolerable conditions against which to revolt. Civil Rights Twain was an adamant supporter of the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of slaves. Even going so far as to say, Lincoln's proclamation not only set the black slaves free, but set the white man free also. He argued that non-whites did not receive justice in the United States, once saying, I've seen Chinamen abused and maltreated in all the mean, cowardly ways possible to the invention of a degraded nature but I never saw a Chinaman righted in a court of justice for wrongs thus done to him. He paid for at least one black person to attend Yale Law School and for another black person to attend a Southern university to become a minister. Twain's forward-thinking views on race were not reflected in his early writings on American Indians. Of them, Twain wrote in 1870, his heart is a cesspool of falsehood, of treachery, and of low and devilish instincts. With him, gratitude is an unknown emotion. And when one does him a kindness, it is safest to keep the face toward him, lest the reward be an arrow in the back. To accept of a favor from him is to assume a debt which you can never repay to his satisfaction, though you bankrupt yourself trying, the scum of the earth. As counterpoint, Twain's essay on the literary offenses of Fenimore Cooper offers a much kinder view of Indians. No, other Indians would have noticed these things, but Cooper's Indians never notice anything. 
Cooper thinks they are marvelous creatures for noticing, but he was almost always in error about his Indians. There was seldom a sane one among them. In his later travelogue, Following the Equator, 1897, Twain observes that in colonized lands all over the world, savages have always been wronged by whites in the most merciless ways, such as robbery, humiliation, and slow, slow murder, through poverty and the white man's whiskey. His conclusion is that there are many humorous things in this world, among them the white man's notion that he is less savage than the other savages. In an expression that captures his East Indian experiences, he wrote, So far as I'm able to judge, nothing has been left undone, either by man or nature, to make India the most extraordinary country that the sun visits on his rounds, where every prospect pleases and only man is vile. Twain was also a supporter of women's suffrage, as evidenced by his votes for women's speech given in 1901, Helen Keller benefited from Twain's support as she pursued her college education and publishing, despite her disabilities and financial limitations. The two were friends for roughly 16 years. Through Twain's efforts, the Connecticut legislature voted a pension for Prudential Crandall since 1995, Connecticut's official heroine, for her efforts towards the education of young African-American women in Connecticut. Twain also offered to purchase for her use her former house in Canterbury, home of the Canterbury Female Boarding School, but she declined. Political Parties Twain was a Republican for most of his life. However, in 1884, he publicly broke with his party and joined the Mugwumps to support the Democratic nominee, Grover Cleveland, over the Republican nominee, James G. Blaine, whom he considered a corrupt politician. Twain spoke at rallies in favor of Cleveland. In the 20th century, he began decrying both Democrats and Republicans as insane and proposed in his 1907 book, Christian Science, that while each party recognized the other's insanity, only the mugwumps, that is, those who eschewed party loyalties in favor of voting for the best man, could perceive the overall madness linking the two. Religion Twain was a Presbyterian. He was critical of organized religion and certain elements of Christianity through his later life. He wrote, for example, Faith is believing what you know ain't so, and if Christ were here now, there's one thing he would not be, a Christian. With anti-Catholic sentiment rampant in 19th century America, Twain noted he was educated to enmity toward everything that is Catholic. As an adult, he engaged in religious discussions and attended services, his theology developing as he wrestled with the deaths of loved ones and with his own mortality. Twain generally avoided publishing his most controversial opinions on religion in his lifetime, and they are known from essays and stories that were published later. In the essay, Three Statements of the 80s, in the 1880s, Twain stated that he believed in an almighty God, but not in any messages, revelations, holy scriptures such as the Bible, providence, or retribution in the afterlife. He did state that the goodness, the justice, and the mercy of God are manifested in his works, but also that the universe is governed by strict and immutable laws, which determine small matters such as who dies in a pestilence. At other times, he plainly professed a belief in providence. In some later writings in the 1890s, he was less optimistic about the goodness of God, observing that if our Maker is all-powerful for good or evil, he's not in his right mind. At other times, he conjectured sardonically that perhaps God had created the world with all its tortures for some purpose of his own, but was otherwise indifferent to humanity, which was too petty and insignificant to deserve his attention anyway. In 1901, Twain criticized the actions of the missionary Dr. William Scott Ament, 1851-1909, because Ament and other missionaries had collected indemnities from Chinese subjects in the aftermath of the Boxer Uprising of 1900. Twain's response to hearing of Ament's methods was published in the North American Review in February 1901 to the person sitting in darkness and deals with examples of imperialism in China, South Africa, and with the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. A subsequent article, To My Missionary Critics, published in the North American Review in April 1901, unapologetically continues his attack, but with the focus shifted from Ament to his missionary superiors, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. 
After his death, Twain's family suppressed some of his work that was especially irreverent toward conventional religion, including Letters from the Earth, which was not published until his daughter Clara reversed her position in 1962 in response to Soviet propaganda about the withholding. The anti-religious The Mysterious Stranger was published in 1916. Little Bessie, a story ridiculing Christianity, was first published in the 1972 collection Mark Twain's Fables of Man. He raised money to build a Presbyterian church in Nevada in 1864. Twain created a reverent portrayal of Joan of Arc, a subject over which he had obsessed for 40 years, studied for dozen years, and spent two years writing about. In 1900, and again in 1908, he stated, I like Joan of Arc best of all my books. It is the best. Those who knew Twain well late in life recount that he dwelt on the subject of the afterlife. His daughter Clara sang, sometimes he believed death ended everything, but most of the time he felt sure of a life beyond. Twain's frankest views on religion appeared in his final work, Autobiography of Mark Twain, the publication of which started in November 2010, 100 years after his death. In it, he said, There's one notable thing about our Christianity. Bad, bloody, merciless, money-grabbing, and predatory as it is. In our country particularly, and in all other Christian countries in a somewhat modified degree, it is still a hundred times better than the Christianity of the Bible, with its prodigious crime, the invention of hell, measured by our Christianity of today, bad as it is, hypocritical as it is, empty and hollow as it is, Neither the deity nor his son is a Christian, nor qualified for that moderately high place. Ours is a terrible religion. The fleets of the world could swim in spacious comfort in the innocent blood it has spilled. Twain was a Freemason. He belonged to Polar Star Lodge No. 79, AF and AM, based in St. Louis. He was initiated and entered apprentice on May 22, 1861, passed to the degree of fellow craft on June 12th and raised to the degree of Master Mason on July 10th. Twain visited Salt Lake City for two days and met their members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They also gave him a Book of Mormon. He later wrote in Roughing It about that book, The book seems to be merely a prosy detail of imaginary history, with the Old Testament for a model, followed by a tedious plagiarism of the New Testament. Vivisection Twain was opposed to the vivisection practices of his day. His objection was not on a scientific basis, but rather an ethical one. He specifically cited the pain caused to the animal as his basis of his opposition. I'm not interested to know whether vivisection produces results that are profitable to the human race or doesn't. The pains which it inflicts upon unconsenting animals is the basis of my enmity towards it, and it is to me sufficient justification of the enmity without looking further. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today, while we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back next time when we answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the links for our show.